I mean, Pastor Alex, thank you. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. And uh, what I'd like to talk about this evening um, is we're going to talk about a worldwide flood. So um, this is a big issue uh, because this is a huge part of the Bible. And so we want to know, did the flood actually happen? And uh, do we have evidence that the flood actually happened? So why don't we pray and then we'll hop right into it. Lord, thank you so much for this evening, Lord. Thank you that we could be here, Lord. Thank you for your word, that we can build our lives on your word, that it's trustworthy. Everything it tells us about reality, about life is true, God. What it talks to us about history, what it talks to us about science, what it talks to us about spirituality and and, uh, our personalities and psychology and everything, Lord. Um, We can base our lives on your word. It's the rock on which we can build our lives, Lord. So we just pray, God, that tonight, as we look at this issue, Lord, that you would just strengthen our faith in you and our trust in your word, and that we would be able to communicate and be a brighter light, just a little bit brighter light, uh, because of what we learned tonight, Lord. So we give this evening to you in Jesus' name. Everybody say it. Amen. Amen. Okay. So this is actually one of my favorite subjects to talk about. Uh, The only thing I like a little bit better is dinosaurs, so... Dinosaurs is next time, okay? So next time we'll talk about dinosaurs. So there's actually a ton of evidence for the flood, um, even though if you study uh, geology today, most people are going to say there is no evidence for the flood. We're going to look at that tonight, and I'll show you that there is quite a bit of evidence for that. Okay, so um, anybody seen, um, uh, you know, Answers in Genesis, they just built a full-size ark. Um, It's as big as the dimensions that are recorded in the Bible. It's in Kentucky. Anybody heard about this? The ark that they built? Yeah, pretty phenomenal. Um, It's finished now. Ken Ham was building it. Uh, I believe it's the largest wooden structure in the entire world. And they've got all kinds of exhibits all throughout it uh, demonstrating what kind of animals would have been on the ark. Uh, A lot of the animals on the ark wouldn't have been animals we're familiar with today. And we will talk about dinosaurs. If If you take the Bible for what it says, there actually would have been dinosaurs on the ark. And uh, there's actually a a lot of evidence that dinosaurs went extinct recently, not millions of years ago. Now, the flood is an event that is about judgment, okay? So ultimately, the Bible is very clear that the reason the flood happened was because the world was filled with wickedness. If the flood really happened, it means God is very serious about judging evil and what? Sin. Sin, that's correct, okay? And so... Uh, The Bible says in Genesis chapter 6, God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. Now this is not because um, God God loves people. A lot of people have difficulty with this. How can God love people and yet have this happen? Right? It says here in Matthew chapter 24, As it was in the days of Noah, so will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, Up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So what Jesus is saying here is this, that the flood is a real historical event, and that we can look at the story of the flood, and we can know how important it is that we're prepared for the coming of Christ. Now it's interesting that it says that people didn't know the flood was going to come. They were going on vacation, they were buying homes, they were going to their jobs, they were getting degrees... They were deciding who they were going to date. They were going to decide who who they were going to marry. And yet, they didn't realize that very soon they weren't going to be doing any of those things. And this is really important because the reason people weren't aware that the flood was going to happen is because they weren't concerned about the things of God, right? If you're concerned about the things of God, then you will be prepared for what's coming. So, for example, Jesus says, he says that there are going to be signs that we're going to be able to see when the end is near. Now, the, he's very specific about the signs, but if you don't study the Word of God, you won't know what those signs are, and then you won't be prepared, right? And so it's so important that we're studying the Word of God so that we can be aware of what's happening, right? Jesus said, when he comes, make sure he doesn't find you sleeping. Stay awake, right? And what is that referring to? It's referring to us to be constantly in mind that Christ is coming back. It's very important, right? So, let's say there's a situation here. Um, you have a, a guy on a cell phone, and he sees a kid uh, being beat up, right? But he's too busy to really pay attention. And so he says, okay, have fun. Uh, and the little kid needs help, but he's on his cell phone, and he's busy, and he's got things to do, and he just walks away, right? Anybody ever been in that situation? <clears throat> right? So 
Would God be good if he let murder, child abuse, rape, lying, stealing, bullying, and every other sin ultimately go unpunished? This is an important question. If you have a, have a police officer and he sees a crime in progress, but he's too busy to handle the crime and he walks away, is he a good police officer or a bad police officer? He's bad because somebody who's expected to do good but ignores the evil that's going on is bad. And a judge that lets a murderer go is actually a bad judge. A judge that lets crime go unpunished is an evil judge. But God is good, and so he can't allow evil to go unpunished. He's in a dilemma. He loves people, but they've committed horrible acts, right? Uh, a while back, when I think it was the first time I came, I went through, the, I went through those questions, have you ever told a lie in your whole life, right? Yes, we've all told lies. Have you ever stolen something in your whole life? Yes, we've all stolen things. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Blasphemy. You've used God's name as a cuss word. You stub your toe and you, you use God's name in vain. Or have you ever looked at somebody with lust? We've all committed sins. And by God's standards, sin deserves death. And so God's in a difficult position because in order to be a good God, he must punish sin. But he doesn't want people to go to hell. And this is the whole reason that Jesus Christ died for our sins. Because somebody had to take the wrath of God. Somebody has to satisfy the justice of God. Because God is just. Perfectly just, in fact. God is love, 1 John 4, 8. He is the rock, his works are perfect, and all his ways are just. The faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. Deuteronomy 32, 4. He is perfectly just. He carries out justice absolutely perfectly. And there's not a single word that's spoken that he's not aware of. You know, and some people say, but what if it's just a small thing? You know, I just did a little thing wrong. But the problem is, is that God can see the far-reaching consequences of small sins. We'll look at something and say, that's it's not a big deal. And God says, but you don't see the long-term impact of that not a big deal. I'll give you an example. Let's say there's a couple... And they end up, um, they they end up sleeping together prior to being married. They get married, and uh, a young man finds out that they actually slept together before they were they got married. But their marriage seems good. Now he doesn't know what goes on behind closed doors. He doesn't know all the difficult discussions that take place. And he thinks to himself, "They're fine. Look at them. They were in love. They did that before they got married." There's nothing bad that happened to them. So what's the big deal if I do that too? And so he ends up doing that also, but he ends up with his girlfriend getting pregnant. And then his girlfriend, who's not a Christian, has an abortion. And so what you see here is what looked like something that wasn't that big of a deal down the road becomes a big deal. Or take another example. Somebody's in the habit of running red lights. Now, now we think to ourselves, oh, it's no big deal. Nobody's around. I'm in a hurry. i got to get there. And this, this person runs a red light. Well, his little child, his, his, his 11-year-old kid is in the car with him. And he gets to used to seeing his father run these red lights. And so he decides, as he gets older, I can run red lights too. But he gets his driver's license, and the first red light he runs, he gets hit by another car, and he ends up, maybe somebody ends up dying in the accident. So what we look at and we go, that's no big deal. God says, I can see every impact that every small sin you think about actually has. And so he can see all that impact. And the Bible says that that's why he flooded the earth. Because everybody's heart was evil. There was nobody who cared to do right. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn. Turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? You know, God is very clear. I don't want people to die. I want people to live. But people continue to go their own way. And ultimately, I have to be just and good. And I have to bring judgment in order to be a good God. If I stop bringing judgment, then I cease to be good. Okay, and so this is why Christ is so necessary. This is why he had to die. That's why when he said, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. And his father essentially said, there is no other way. In order to save these people, justice must be served. Okay, so that was no small sacrifice. Now, 
I'm not going to read all of the flood story, but if you want to read it, it's in uh, Genesis chapter 6. It goes all the way through Genesis chapter 9. It's an amazing story. And there's so many details in there that we tend to just skim over. But it's a very, very interesting story. And it says there, I'm going to put an end to all people for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And then it describes the ark perfectly. It tells how big it will. It tells who's going to be on the ark. It tells what animals are going to be on the ark. It's very, very detailed. Um, And then, uh, this is probably what the inside of the ark looked like, uh, very likely. Uh, It was very big. It was probably about uh, almost two football fields long. Very, very big boat. Now, um, most people will say, well, how could he fit all the animals on there? Uh, That's crazy, right? Well, if we do the dinosaur one next time, I'll go into details about how you would fit dinosaurs on there and how you have all those animals able to fit on there. But right now, what I'm going to focus on is the evidence for an actual flood. Was there actually a worldwide flood? Okay, so he goes through there. He talks about all the animals that are going to be on there. He talks about how long it's going to flood for, right? 40 days and 40 nights. Um, And then he goes on and he talks about uh, that the, the rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights, but the, the waters were actually on the earth for a lot longer than, than that. 150 days until the waters started to recede, and it was almost a year that they were actually on the ark until dry land uh, appeared. It says there that the waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than 20 feet. So the Bible says that all the mountains on planet earth were covered to a depth of more than 20 feet. Now a lot of people will say, if I talk to atheists about this, they'll say that's impossible. There's not enough water on the planet to cover Mount Everest to a depth of 20 feet. Water seeks its own level, and therefore, that's impossible. Now, the the reason that was possible is because Mount Everest didn't exist until the flood happened. So, the mountains were a lot lower prior to the flood. They got a lot bigger afterwards. Now, if you've heard of Pangaea, anybody heard of Pangaea? Okay, Pangaea is the idea that the whole Earth, a long time ago, used to have one gigantic continent. Okay? Now, both creationists and evolutionists believe in Pangaea, but evolutionists will say that Pangaea broke apart slowly over millions of years. Creationists will typically say it happened very rapidly. Okay? And so what happened was when the, when the flood came, the waters burst out from under the crust of the earth, that's what the Bible says, in one day, and then all the continents began to be pushed away from one another. The con- Pangaea broke up, and as they collided, the tectonic plates collided, That's what created the mountains. And as the mountains rose up, the waters came off the continents, flowed off the continents, into the ocean basins that were now created. So you didn't have as big of oceans prior to the flood. And now you have huge oceans, and that's why we have so much water on the crust of the earth today. It's because of the fact that the flood, the waters came out from under the crust of the earth, they came on top of the earth, they flowed all off the continents, into the oceans, and now we have 80% of the earth covered in water. Now, again, we'll look at the science of this and see if this is uh, legitimate, okay? So there it is. The animals all get off the ark. They spread out, and they begin reproducing, and uh, that's what happens. So in Japan, in 2011, there was a tsunami. 125,000 buildings were destroyed, 11,000 deaths, 16,000 missing persons. Horrible, horrible tragedy. This was... uh, Japan, part of Japan beforehand. This was it when the flood uh, started to happen. They, they, there was photos and everything. But floods are uh, devastating, aren't they? They're horribly devastating. <clears throat> the damage that was done. And this was just a local flood in Japan. Can you imagine the damage that a worldwide flood would do? We should have no problem with identifying features that were caused by the flood on planet Earth. Okay, here's a quick clip from 2012. Anybody seen this movie? 2012, yeah. Okay, so this was a... Oh, didn't play. Is there a play button on there? You know what? That's okay. We can skip it. Don't worry about it. I got lots of other stuff to show. Anyway, that 20... If you haven't seen 2012, that movie is all about a worldwide flood present day. Uh, very interesting movie. They show all the devastation that would happen. Volcanoes, uh, all kinds of earthquakes. There would have just been all kinds of devastation. So the Bible says in 2 Peter 2, 1, 5, that um, people, well, first of all, it says here that uh, God did not spare the ancient world except for Noah and the seven others in his family. Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment, so God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people with a vast flood. And so Noah and his family were the only ones that were spared. Now, of course, the benefit of teaching this never happened is that you don't have to deal with your sins. Okay, this guy, Richard, um, this is not Richard, this is Bill Maher. 
It says here in 2 Peter 3, 3 through 7, first of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. But they literally forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world at that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Anybody that does not put their hope and their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, if I could convince you that Noah's flood never happened, well, that would make you doubt the Bible. Because the Bible, all of the Bible revolves around this flood. There's a lot of stuff that's in there, right? This guy, Charles Lyell, said the flood never happened. He said, everything you see on planet Earth was caused over millions and millions of years. There never was a flood. Well, if there never was a flood, then maybe there's never going to be a Jesus bringing judgment, you see? And so this is the difficulty. It's called uniformitarianism, and it requires lots of time, just like evolution. Now, here's the Grand Canyon. Anybody ever been to the Grand Canyon? Pretty amazing. Um, these layers in the Grand Canyon, a, an evolutionist is going to say those were laid down over millions and millions of years, the strata in there. Now, a, a, a creationist is going to say these layers were laid down very quickly um, after the worldwide flood. They were laid down uh, very quickly. Okay, now, we actually have a lot of evidence for that. But an evolutionist is going to say, the farther down you go in the strata, um, the older our evolutionary ancestors are, right? So you get all the way down here and you get to things that, uh, single-celled organisms and these stuff, you get all the way to the top, you get humans. That's what they're going to say. Okay, so the two basic theories about the past are creationist timeline. 6,000 years ago was creation. 4,400 years ago there was a flood. 2,000 years ago was Christ. Evolutionary timeline is 14 billion years ago, there was a big bang. 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth forms. 3.8 billion years ago, the first life appears. And then 2.5 million years ago, the human line diverges from its ape-like ancestor. And so, we're going to look at this and say, from a geological perspective, which makes the most sense? Okay, creationism says, the Earth's geologic features were caused by a worldwide uh, flood, as well as small local floods. Humanism, uh, macroevolution, says the Earth's geologic features were fashioned mostly by slow, gradual processes with few catastrophes. So when I talk to an atheist about this, they say, yeah, there was floods, small floods all over the Earth. And I say, no, 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 there was one huge flood, and then a lot of little floods afterwards that were caused by leftover water that hadn't drained off the Earth and so forth. Okay, this guy, Walt Brown, he used to be an atheist and an evolutionist. Well, he studied extensively the tectonic plates and the physics involved in the flood. Eventually he became a Christian, and today he's a Bible-believing creationist. <clears throat> he taught colleges, uh, college courses in physics, mathematics, and computer science. He's a retired Air Force full colonel, West Point graduate, former Army Ranger, and paratrooper. Um, he used to work for Binet Laboratories. Um, he's a tenured associate professor at the U.S. Air Force Academy and chief of science and technology studies at the Air War College. If you want a book that's really heavy science, get his book in the beginning. It's incredible. Uh, it's absolutely amazing the physics it goes into for the flood. For much of his life he was an evolutionist, but he eventually became a Bible-believing creationist. Listen to what he says here about the flood. You got volume for me? We can see on our planet 17 very strange features that can now be systematically explained as a result of a cataclysmic global flood whose water is erupted from subterranean chambers with an energy release exceeding the explosion of 10 billion hydrogen bombs. This explanation shows us just how rapidly major mountains are formed. It explains the coal and oil deposits, rapid continental drift. By ocean floors have huge trenches, hundreds of canyons and volcanoes. It explains the formation of the layered strata and most of the fossil record. The so-called ice ages and major land canyons, especially the Grand Canyon. The pre-flooder probably had one very large supercontinent containing lush vegetation, seas, rivers, and minor mountains. According to the hydroplate theory, the pre-flooder had a lot of subterranean water about half what is now in our oceans. This water was in interconnected chambers, forming a thin spherical shell, about half a mile thick, perhaps 10 miles 
along the Earth's surface. This is the Earth's surface here. Increasing pressure in the subterranean bottom chamber stretch the overlying crust. This is a blue stretch. It's when the pressure inside it increases. Failure in the crust began with a microscopic crack, which grew in both directions at about three miles per second. The crack, following the path of this resistance, encircled the globe in about two hours. As the crack raced around the Earth, the overlying crust opened up like a rip in a tightly stretched cloth. The subterranean water was under extreme pressure because of the weight the 10 miles of rock pressing down on it. So the water exploded violently out of the brush. Calculations show that all along this low encircling crack, fountains of water jetted supersonically over 20 miles into the atmosphere. The spray from this enormous fountain produced torrential rains such as the Earth has never experienced before or after. The Bible states that all the fountains of the great deep burst open on one day. And it describes these events about four and a half thousand years ago, which we can now tie together scientifically in cause and effect order as the hyperplate theory. The fountains of the great deep and the expanding steam produced violent winds. Some of the water jetting high above the cold stratosphere froze into supercool ice crystals and produced some massive ice storms, varying, suffocating, and instantly freezing many animals. The high pressure fountains eroded the rock on both sides of the crack and even threw up the lining contents of many pre flood seas. Huge volumes of sediments settled out of this muddy water all over the earth. These sediments trapped and buried plants and animals, forming the fossil record. The flooding uprooted vegetation, moving into regions where it accumulated and quickly became coal and oil by processes we can duplicate in the laboratory today. Experiments show that as erosion widened the rush, its width became so great that the compressed rock beneath the subterranean chamber sprung up, giving birth to the mid-oceanic ridge that wraps around the earth like the scene of baseball. The continental plates, the hydroplates, still with lubricating water beneath, slid downhill away from the rising mid-Atlantic ridge. After the massive, slowly accelerating continental plates reached speeds of about 45 miles an hour, they ran into resistances, compressed, crushed, thickened, and buckled. The portions of the hydro plates buckled up formed mountains. These are the mountains Those coming up. buckled down formed ocean trenches. This is why these features are generally parallel to the oceanic ridges from which they slid. Okay, so he there's a lot more to that too. He explains all that happens. What's interesting is that if you look here, um, the Bible says in Psalm 24, 1 through 2, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. He founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. It says he established the earth on the seas, not the seas on the earth. Right? The earth is on the seas. That looks backwards, except that it's not. And that's not the only place where the Bible says that. What they're now finding, they're finding something called ringwoodite, and ringwoodite is basically diamonds with water in it. What they're discovering now is there is still more water under the crust of the earth than there actually is water on top of the earth. Even today, there's more water under the crust of the earth than water on top of the crust of the earth. And Psalm 136.6 says, To him that stretched out the earth above the waters. Notice it's stretching out the earth above the waters, not the waters on top of the earth. And what this does is confirms what science has found today is that there's tons of water under the crust of the earth. This is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which is what um, Walt Brown was talking about. This is the rip in the earth where all the water came out. Most atheists will say, how would you have enough rain fall? Well, the rain actually came up from the crust of the earth and then fell. That's why all that rain rained for 40 days. And this right here is actually a tear in the earth that goes all the way around the earth. This is in Iceland. Part of it comes up on Iceland. 
Now, how are you going to explain that from an evolutionary perspective? What is this gigantic tear on the earth? Well, biblical history shows us exactly what it is. <clears throat> okay? It says right here, in the 600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of heaven were opened. And here we still have water coming out from under the crust of the earth. Okay, so uh, there it is. Let's look at evidence one. We're going to go through a bunch of evidences now. Historical records. There are over 400 flood stories from, from cultures all over the planet. On planet Earth, 400 cultures that have flood stories. In Hawaii, they have a story that says, Long after the death of Kunihuhana, the first man, the world became a wicked, terrible place to live. There was one good man left. His name was Nu'u. He made a great canoe with a house on it and filled it with animals. The waters came up over all the earth and killed all the people. Only Nu'u and his family were saved. Sounds a lot like Noah. Interesting. <clears throat> There's a Hulapai, uh, I don't know if I'm saying that right, Hulapai, Hulapai, whatever, uh, story also. It says, it rained for 45 days and the whole earth was flooded. All the people were destroyed except for one old man atop Spirit Mountain. Many days passed and a dove brought him instructions from the Creator to drive a ram's horn into the earth. The old man obeyed and the waters were drained. He sent the dove forth and when it returned with fresh grass in his feet, he rejoiced for the land had become dry. Now, I think he got it a little off with the ram's horn in the earth there, but... He's got the dove, and he's got all these other things. That's pretty amazing. <clears throat> Here's another one. An ancient Chinese classic called The High King tells the story of Fu Hai, whom the Chinese consider to be the father of their civilization. This history records that Fu Hai, his wife, three sons, and three daughters escaped... Wait, wait, how many people is that? That's eight. That's exactly what the Bible says. He and his family were the only people alive on Earth. After the Great Flood, they repopulated the world. <clears throat> Uh, the Toltec legend is very interesting. It says, the first world lasted 1,716 1, years and was destroyed by a great flood that covered the highest mountains. Only one family named Cox Cox survived. What's really interesting about that one is that they're only 60 years off from the same amount of time that the Bible says happened before when Adam was created to when the flood happened. Only 60 years different from what the Bible says. Here's another one, the Gilgamesh epic. Anybody heard of Gilgamesh? Uh, the kids have to study this in school all the time. Tablet 11, it's very similar to the flood story in Genesis uh, 6 through 9. It says, <clears throat> this was found in Nineveh, by the way, in Assyria. And it also tells the whole story of a flood and a guy that actually is looking for a man that knows the secret to eternal life that lives on a boat. As Gilgamesh is looking for a man that's, look, that, that's been around for a really long time and lives on a boat. <clears throat> Pretty interesting. So, if you put it all together, you end up with 88% of the stories have a favorite family, 66% are forewarned, forewarned, 66% say the flood is due to wickedness, and there's all these similarities. Um, a flood is the only thing, 95%, it was a global flood, 95%, survival is due to a boat, 70%, animals are also saved, 67%. So these stories all over the world, I had a guy tell me, well, of course there's flood stories all over the world, because there's floods all over the world. No, no, no. These stories are way too similar to all the different stories. If you put them all together, you get this. <clears throat> Once there was a worldwide flood sent by God to judge the wickedness of man, but there was one righteous family which was forewarned of the coming flood. They built a boat on which they survived the flood along with the animals. As the flood ended, their boat landed on a high mountain from which they descended and repopulated the whole earth. You could actually rebuild the story of Noah's flood, even without the Bible, based on the stories that are all over the world. Now, it makes sense. Consider this. If there was a worldwide flood... Noah gets off the ark with his kids. They start having families. And they get around to Christmas time, right? And, well, there's no Christmas yet. But they get around to uh, a holiday, right? They're celebrating whatever they're celebrating at that point in time. And one of Noah's great, great, great grandkids uh, sits on, on granddaddy Noah's lap. And he says, granddaddy, what happened? Right? Where are all the people? And he tells them the story of the flood. And as the people spread out all over the earth, what goes with them? The history of where they came from. And so what do you end up with? You end up with flood stories all over planet Earth. The Sumerian king list, uh, which was excavated uh, in 1922, this also talks about a worldwide flood. There's 15 copies of this around the world. It's one of the oldest historical records we have. And it actually talks about the same people in the Bible. It talks about Uruk and Ur and all these people that are in the list in the Bible, and it talks about a worldwide flood. <laughs> Mentions the flood, mentions uh, a city Kish and a king who was Noah's grandson, Cush. 
It talks about people living very, very long. Right? Which is exactly what the Bible says. It talks about Babylon, Uruk, Akkad, Kala, Nineveh. Um, and it talks about a man who was on the ark named, I don't know how you pronounce that, but whatever. <clears throat> okay, let's move on to evidence number two. Fossils can form quickly. A lot of people think fossils take millions of years to form. Um, but do fossils actually take a long time to form? Now, if I was driving along out in the desert, God forbid, and I hit a coyote, and the coyote fell off on the side of the road and it died, and it, it lied there, and we kept driving, and uh, would that coyote turn into a fossil? Anybody know? Would the coyote that died on the side of the road, would it turn into a fossil? Okay, the answer is no, it wouldn't, okay? <clears throat> what if I buried it? My kids were like, Dad, give the coyote a burial, right? And I got out, and I was like, okay, I buried it. Would it turn into a fossil? No, it wouldn't. Okay, so, did I trick you there? I tricked you on. So, no, it wouldn't turn into a fossil. Because to create a fossil, you have to have very special conditions. And that's not good enough. Okay? Um, watch this quick clip. Um, this is not a Christian who made this, but he does a good job of explaining how fossils form. Today's lesson is on fossilizing. I'm your teacher, Dr. Dino. Fossils are the amazing animals. Like dinosaurs that lived long ago and have been preserved in stone. Let's take a look at how fossilization works. First, the dinosaur would have to die. Ah, oh, that's horrible. Aha, oh, that's better. There's something now out with the guy that The best places for bachelor curve would be near swamps or rivers. So that sediment, particles of sand or mud, completely cover the body. When covered up, the remains are protected from scavengers and decay. Over time, the layers of sediment accumulate. Mineral-rich groundwater enters spaces of certain parts of the animal's remains, such as the bones, shells, or plates. When the minerals are wrong, right there. Your that's wrong. wrong. Are slowly replaced by animal that's wrong. That's wrong. Over time, the fossils may become exposed as sediment is worn away. And that's when paleontologists. Okay, so to form a fossil, you need what? What was the missing ingredient for the coyote? Anybody get it? Shout it out. Water. Very good. Very good. You get a star. Okay, so. You have to have rapid burial to protect the specimen from scavengers. If the coyote died, immediately scavengers would come and just tear that coyote apart. Um, but on the other hand, even if I buried it and I had no water, um, there would be nothing to replace the organic material with minerals. Basically, the way fossils are formed is if you have a bone in the ground and water is running through the, the earth, the bone acts as a mold or a cast. And minerals replace the bone and you're left with a rock formation of the bone. Does that make sense, what I just said? Okay, that's how fossils are formed. So you need quick burial, and you need a lot of water and mud. Well, the flood is just perfect for quick burial and lots of water and mud. So this is what happens to something that doesn't get buried quickly. Scavengers very quickly eat things, okay? This is a lizard, but not for very long. He's a dead lizard, by the way. These are ants. This is a time-lapse video. Isn't that crazy? Okay, the date is 1-7-2008. There goes the lizard. Okay, now it's 1 8 2008. Do you think they're going to be able to take it all away? How are they going to carry that head? This is kind of a gross, gross lesson, isn't it? But I teach high school students, so you have to understand. Look, and they're struggling here. They're like, what do we do with this? How do we move it, right? Oh my goodness. You didn't know ants were that strong. Now they're kind of just playing. They're just like kind of juggling around here, playing tug of war. Oh, there it goes. That's just one eight. 
That's 1-8-2008. That was one day. One day. You see, if, if dead things aren't buried very quickly, scavengers will destroy them very, very rapidly. You know, we never find any whale bones because there's so many scavengers in the ocean. If a whale dies, it's gone very quickly. Did you know we used to have 300 million buffalo in America? But we have no buffalo fossils. We had as many buffalo in America as we do have people today. And yet we have no buffalo fossils. Why? Because they weren't buried. It wasn't the right conditions to create fossils. So you need very specific conditions to create a fossil. But fossils can form very quickly. This is a petrified cowboy leg. Now, I don't know how his leg got petrified. I was thinking maybe he was running along. He lost his horse and he's running away from a mountain lion. His leg went inside a, a dry creek bed, but it was like really muddy or just a little bit of water. His leg got stuck. Then the mountain lion ate him. And then his leg got stuck down there and he couldn't get it out. And the water kept flowing through and it, it did that. Now, now think here. Was this millions of years ago? No, because they didn't have cowboy boots millions of years ago. So clearly not. Okay? So this is a, what's called an apiosaur. And what's unusual about it is it's giving birth. Look at that. Now, birth happens relatively quickly. So this had to have been buried very quickly in order for it to get, get fossilized. Okay, this is a petrified hat. Are you kidding me? You can, did you know you can fossilize? If you have a hat you really like, you can fossilize it and keep it. Look at that. Awesome. Isn't that awesome? Now, this didn't happen millions of years ago. That happened quickly. This is a petrified pickle. Right? If you really like pickles and you want to save it for a long time, you just petrify it. This is a petrified bag of flour. Right? These are hundreds, there are hundreds of dinosaur uh, eggs that are fossilized in China. And eggs are very fragile. Well, how do you fossilize an egg? It has to be buried very rapidly. This right here is what's called the dropping well. This is over in uh, Britain, and they put, they hang things underneath here, and the water drops the minerals, replace whatever you hang up there. So people have hung all kinds of stuff, ice skates, underwear, that's weird, uh, teddy bears, a lot of people petrify teddy bears, I don't know why, but they do, and uh, this is a close-up of a petrified teddy bear. And so, you know, you, you can try this at home. Get your favorite stuffed animal and see if you can petrify it, right? <laughs> Just kidding. It's not very snuggly if you try to snuggle it, all right? So, whoa, here it comes. There it comes, the teddy bear. Okay, so um, this right here is petrified rope. Um, the, the quickest thing I, I know of that was petrified, it took two weeks to petrify a piece of rope. Two weeks. Because all it takes is the right circumstances. See, this idea that it takes millions of years to form a fossil, it's not true. Now, scientists know this, but it's just a popular myth out there because it works well with evolution and dinosaur bones. Okay, it's petrified. Let's look at another one, evidence three, marine fossils on the tops of mountains and far inland. This one's amazing. Do you know what the highest mountain was before they found Mount Everest? Anybody know what the highest mountain was before they found Mount Everest? Yeah. Okay, good try. Anybody else? Yeah. Mount Everest, good job, that's right. It was Mount Everest. The highest mountain before they found Mount Everest was still Mount Everest. Okay, so, <laughs> how did you know that, man? That was really good, that was really good. Huh? You just an A plus. Okay, how high is Mount Everest? Mount Everest is 29,000 feet or five and a half miles. I would hate to be one of these guys, like right now. Like that would be awful, right? I wanna go home and go to sleep. If you're stuck on the side of a mountain, you can't go home and go to sleep. It's like, what do you do, right? Um, what kind of fossils they found on top of my Everest? Here's what's amazing. They actually find ocean animal fossils on the top of Mount Everest. They're called crinoids. And these are live in the ocean, and yet they're on top of Mount Everest. Now you have to tell me, how did they get five and a half miles up in the air? Well, if the Bible is true, and there was a worldwide flood, and they were buried, and then the mountains went up like this, well, that makes a lot of sense, right? It makes perfect sense. The evolutionists can't explain this, right? You know what their theory is? Their theory is, it used to be in the ocean, the animals were down there, and then it slowly went up like this, but it took millions and millions of years. Now here's the problem with saying that. If it was going up super slowly, right, and you're an animal, what are you gonna do? You're gonna move down the mountain with, you're gonna stay in the water. The only way you're gonna stay up on the mountain is if you die before the mountain goes up, and it goes up very rapidly. That makes sense. Okay, now how far is Mount Everest from the ocean? Mount Everest is 450 miles from the ocean. How do ocean fossils get five and a half miles up in the air, 450 miles from the ocean? 
Well, I think there was a worldwide flood. You know, uh, anybody here like clams, to eat clams or oysters or anything? Yeah, this little guy right here. You know, clams, live clams are closed. Why are live clams closed? Anybody know? Anyone want to take a guess? Why is a live clam closed? Yeah. Okay, I like that answer, so they don't get killed. Very good, that's wise, okay? Um, they're, when they're alive, they can contract their muscles and they can hold their shells closed. But when they die, they open up because they can no longer hold their muscles closed, right? Well, what's interesting is all over the world, we have closed fossilized clams. Now, what does that mean? I mean, everywhere around the world, there are, you can go right out to Anza Borrego, and there are hundreds of fossilized clams that are all closed. But I thought they, when they died, they opened up. What had to happen? They had to be buried, and then die, and then they can't open up. And these are everywhere. Check this out. The Kentucky State Fossil is the brachiopod, the clam. Now, Kentucky is not near the ocean, but they decided there's so many clams in their state that we're going to make our fossil, our state fossil, the clam, okay? With so many species of brachiopods found throughout the state, Kentucky decided to designate the entire group as its state fossil. <clears throat> Here it is again. Kentucky is 450 miles from the ocean. Now, I don't know why it's the same as Mount Everest. That's weird, but, <clears throat> but nonetheless... There it is. That's pretty amazing. Here's evidence for marine and land fossils mixed together. Watch this. In France, which is three, this location is 300 miles from the ocean, they have found marine creatures buried with spiders, scorpions, millipedes, insects, and reptiles, all buried together, land animals and sea animals, 300 miles inland, all buried together. Now that's strange, isn't it? But that's not the only place. More than 100,000 fossil specimens represent 400 species have been found in Chicago, Illinois. And they're all preserved. Now that's where that is, right there. Here's another one, Florissant, Colorado. A wide variety of insects, freshwater mollusks, fish, birds, and several hundred plant species are buried together. Bees and birds have to be buried rapidly in order to be preserved. Alligator, fish, deep sea bass, chubs, pickerel, herring, garpike, Birds, turtles, mammals, mollusks, crustaceans, many varieties of insects, and palm leaves are buried together in the vast green river formation of Wyoming. This is 1,000 miles from the ocean, and yet you have all these land animals and sea animals buried together. Absolutely incredible. Okay? This is 300 whales, porpoises, turtles, seals, fish, and land animals, such as ground sloths and penguins, were buried together in Peru, South America, 36 miles from the ocean. Now, I don't know how penguins got in the mix there. That's just weird. But there it is. Land animals and sea animals buried together in South America. And they dug them up. This is a gigantic whale fossil. Here's another one. Over 60 whale fossils were found 80 miles from the ocean in the desert of Chile in 2010 when construction crews were expanding the Pan American Highway. Also buried with the whales were dolphins and sloths. Now, I don't know why sloths keep showing up, too. That's weird. Sloths are really slow. Maybe they just couldn't, you know, they couldn't run away as fast, and so they just got buried with a fish. I don't know. But anyway, here it is again. Tons and tons of whale fossils. In fact, they've named it Whale Hill because there's so many whale fossils. How does that happen? How are you going to explain that? <laughs> That's crazy, right? Have any of you heard this before? No, this is crazy, isn't it? But this is real evidence for the worldwide flood. <clears throat> there it is again. Here's another one, geological features that look like they were caused by a flood. Now here's what's amazing. Even people who don't believe in the Bible are starting to recognize that all over the world there are geological features that can only be explained by a flood. Now I got this video from NOVA. Now NOVA is not a Christian organization. They are very atheistic. And yet they did a whole movie on how floods, gigantic floods, are creating the geological features on the earth. Watch this quick clip. For a long time, it was assumed that the scant land's features would have taken millions of years to create. and lakes 
architects in the Scanlands today could not have sculpted this landscape. This water is part of a modern irrigation system and was not here when the Scanlands were created. The only river big enough and old enough is the Columbia, which is 50 miles away, and there is no evidence it ever flowed through the Scanlands. But there's another reason to rule rivers out. No river in the world can form what you are about to see. You will not find these anywhere else on Earth. These enormous potholes are one of the strangest geological features of the planet. If I was on the bottom of a big river like the Columbia, I might find some potholes that were maybe a few feet across, a few feet deep. But this feature, this rock basin, of which there are hundreds in the Channel Scab Lab, is about ten times as big as the potholes that we find in even a large river like the Columbia. It's very clear just from the size of the feature that this was not made by normal river processes. But if not rivers, then what formed this landscape? Boulders like this one pointed toward another possible culprit. How could this 100-ton giant have been dumped on the edge of this 1,000-foot precipice? It's made of granite, and granite is not native to the Scanlands. But granite boulders of many different sizes are scattered erratically throughout the area. Indeed, they are known as erratics. So the two main theories to explain the gradual formation of this landscape just didn't work. River erosion could not explain giant potholes, and ice was too remote from the scablands to create these hanging valleys. During the 1920s, a geologist named J. Harlan Brents outlined a theory of what he thought had really happened to the scablands. But Brents' theory defied all scientific convention. He claimed, he claimed the scablands were not the result of a slow geological evolution, but of an enormous catastrophe that had happened almost overnight. For years, Rex traveled the scablands examining the landscape. Eventually, one feature would clinch his argument although it would take him decades to recognize it. From ground level, these ships don't make much sense. Brett's must have walked over thousands of those things, but they're so big in the field, he had no idea what they were. He just uh, he didn't, he didn't guess what they were. Brett's would not see aerial photographs of these hills for many years. We can see from the air how these shapes begin to look like ripples, a giant version of the ripples left behind on the beach by the sea. Whoa, is that amazing or what? That's incredible. But this isn't just here in the Scatlands. This is everywhere on planet Earth. There's evidence of water just dominating the entire planet. <clears throat> could a rushing mass of water create canyons that look as if they were eroded over millions of years? Like this one, known as Dry Falls, 20 times the size of Niagara Falls. How could water transport these giant erratics that are normally carved out by glaciers? And how could it form these strange potholes found here on such a monumental scale?
To test whether a single flood coming from Lake Missoula could really have done all this, scientists have built their own mini scab lands. Here, the Earth Surface Dynamics team at the University of Minnesota has constructed a scale model of the scab lands and poured water over it to represent the failure of glacial Lake Missoula. Here it comes. The rushing water doesn't simply disperse over a wide area. It gouges up channels and then erodes them into extraordinary shapes. It is only when the water is turned off that the significance of these shapes becomes clear. We're seeing the same essential set of processes. In fact, it's one of the remarkable things about these natural systems is that the same fundamental sets of processes can occur across a very wide range of scales. They're what we call scale independent. For years, scientists argued that the features of the scablands could not have been formed overnight. But this model clearly shows miniature versions of the canyons found in the scablands. Just like the real ones, they look as if they were gradually eroded. In fact, they were carved out in seconds. Wow, isn't that amazing? And see, even secular scientists are starting to agree with what the Bible already teaches. 4,400 years ago, there was a gigantic flood. Anybody here been to Arches National Park? It's in Utah. It's beautiful, right? This is one of the largest arches in Arches National Park. But what's interesting is there are no more arches forming in Arches National Park. In fact, the arches are actually breaking down. One of the most photographed freestanding arches in Arches National Park, Wall Arch, in southeast Utah, collapsed late Monday, early Tuesday of August 4th and 5th, 2008. No one reported seeing it collapse. The arch is located along the popular Devil's Garden Trail and was more than 33 feet tall and 71 feet across before it collapsed. It was the 12th largest arch of the estimated 2,000 arches in Arches National Park. Now here's what's interesting. The arches are falling down, but no more are forming. Pretty soon it's going to be no more Arches National Park, right? So you're going to visit it and all you're going to see is a bunch of broken arches. Oh, that's lame. But here's the, what's interesting. If the arches aren't forming anymore, what does that mean about how the arches were originally formed? You see, if secular geologists were right and the arches were formed through natural processes that are happening today, we would see more arches forming. But because no more arches are forming, it means they were formed by something that's no longer happening. You see where I'm going with this? The flood carved those arches. And the reason more arches aren't forming is because there's no more worldwide floods. Makes perfect sense. Not only that, this right here is a picture of Mars. This article I got about the Pathfinder landing, it says the landing site was an ancient flood plain. It said, scientists chose it because they found it to be a relatively safe surface to land on and one that contained a wide variety of rock deposited during a catastrophic flood. Now it's interesting that they, they acknowledge that this is a floodplain because there's all these rocks that are just laid out randomly across the, the, the space. These are called erratics, remember? We just saw rocks that are just deposited randomly are called erratics, and they're evidence of flood, right? But what's interesting is, look at Yosemite. This is on the tops of the mountains in Yosemite. Those are erratics. Now, nobody points that out because nobody wants to admit there was a worldwide flood. This is in north central Washington. Huge amounts of these erratics. This, again, is on Mars. It says that they have evidence of a striking ancient river on Mars. Now, they're willing to admit when they see rivers on Mars, right? But what about Earth? We have evidence of gigantic canyons carved all over the earth. <clears throat> is this millions of years of erosion? This is in Turkey. Or is that a worldwide flood? This right here is in N N Namibia? I don't know how to say that. But is that erosion? Is that wind and rain that made that? Or is that water piling rocks up on top of each other? <clears throat> 
What about this? This is Monument Valley, Utah, on the border of Arizona. Is that just normal erosion, wind and rain? I don't think so. I think that's a worldwide flood. Here's another one, Bryce Canyon, Utah. Is that millions of years of erosion? Or is that water rushing off the continent, just ripping through, making gigantic canyons in all these, these formations? Here's another one. Is that millions of years of erosion? And that's in Thailand. Here's another one, folded mountains. All over the world there are what are called folded mountains. It's solid rock that's bent, like it's been bent like putty. Now, if you had a plate that was made of uh, what's typically called china, right? China is just rock, it's concrete if somebody has china plates. If you wanted to make a plate into a bowl and you tried to bend it to break it, it would just snap, it would shatter. Even if you put wood on both sides of it and added water and heat and you tried to bend it, from if, if, if you got into engineering, you'd find that the laws of physics say you can't bend it. No matter what, no matter how slow you do it, it will shatter. And what's weird is that we have all these rocks all over the planet that are bent, but they're not shattered and broken. Here's another one. How do you get solid rock to bend? This is another one here. Here's more. Solid rock that's bent but not broken. This is an entire island with bent rock. And this is all over the earth. This right here is in South Wales, Australia. It goes all the way down, makes a U-turn, but there's no shatter marks. There's no breaking. Here's slick rock in Arizona. No breaking. It's just nicely folded and smooth. This is an entire mountain range of folded rock. This is near British Columbia, Canada. The Alps in Switzerland, completely bent, but not broken. Now what's the significance? Here's the significance. The only way you can get a china plate to bend into a bowl is if you ground it down to dust, add water, and then remold it. If you've ever worked with wet cement, you know that you can mold it up until it hardens. Once wet cement hardens, you must ground it down to dust and start over again. Well, what did the worldwide flood do? The worldwide flood grounded everything down to dust. It was all like putty. The tectonic plates were still moving. Things were folding, and then they solidified. Now, an evolutionist is going to say all those different layers you see, they were bent slowly over time, and that's why they're not broken. But physics says no way. These layers were all laid down at the same time. They were all wet at the same time, and they were all bent at the same time, and then they hardened. Okay, evidence seven, large canyons formed quickly, not slowly, over millions of years. As the mountains came up, the water washed off the continents, it ripped through the earth and created canyons everywhere. This right here is what happens when a flood goes through the earth, right? This was in uh, 2002, there was a flood, a spillway that overflowed, Guadalupe River. It ripped right through and created a whole new outlet. Um, here in Texas. So here it is again, it just ripped through uh, there. It, 30 inches of rain in one week, again, just ripped right through. This is what a flood does, right? The river carved a canyon one mile long, over 50 feet deep, and hundreds of yards wide through solid limestone rock. What we've noticed is this, a whole lot of water at the same time will carve canyons. If you have a whole lot of water moving slowly, look at the Amazon River. Or look at the Nile River. There's no gigantic canyons. They're just flowing. But if you have a whole lot of water all quickly, that will carve canyons. In fact, this one right here was a canyon that was formed in six days. It's called the Burlingame Canyon. It's in Walla Walla, Washington. And it was carved. It went from, I think the, the numbers are up here. Let's see. It went from about, I can't see the numbers, but it went from about 15 feet deep to 150 feet deep in six days. A whole lot of water carved the canyon very, very rapidly. This is the Missouri flood uh, carves a Badlands landscape in 2011. This was a flood in Missouri that carved a miniature Badlands landscape. Here it is right here. This is the actual Badlands of South Dakota. And notice that this is just the same thing on a larger scale. It looks exactly the same, it's just much, much bigger. What about the Grand Canyon? Well, the Grand Canyon, I'm going to argue, was created after the flood, as the water was flowing off. Some of the water got trapped and created a gigantic lake near the Grand Canyon. That, that lake's dam eventually broke and all the water rushed through and pushed out all the dirt. <clears throat> okay? So let's take a look at this. 
Anybody scared of heights? Anybody? You might want to close your eyes. Okay, ready? Here we go. <clears throat> Whoa! You know this is a glass bridge. You can actually, excuse me, you can actually see through the bottom of the of the bridge. Would anybody uh, be scared to walk out on that? That would be scary, wouldn't it? What if somebody started jumping at the end? They thought it was funny, and they started jumping. <laughs> You'd be very angry at that person. <clears throat> okay, look at that. There it is. Woo! That's scary stuff. Welcome to Creation Minute. I'm Eric Hoven. Ah, the Grand Canyon. 277 miles long, 10 to 18 miles wide, and more than a mile deep. That's impressive. In the bottom is the Colorado River. You know, some scientists suggest the Colorado River formed the Grand Canyon over millions of years. But take a look at these facts to see it from a different perspective. The Colorado River enters the canyon 2,800 feet above sea level. It exits the canyon 1,800 feet above sea level. And the top of Grand Canyon is 7,000 feet above sea level. So you tell me, did the river flow uphill for millions of years to carve out the Grand Canyon? Or is it possible that the Grand Canyon is the result of a Noah's flood? So learn more about creation, visit us at creationminute.com. Okay, so this is amazing. This is an aerial photo of the Grand Canyon. Now this is the Colorado River down here. The Grand Canyon, though, is 18 miles wide, but the Colorado River is only 500 feet wide. How did the Colorado River carve a canyon 18 miles wide when it's only 500 feet wide? Something's wrong. So the Grand Canyon, the length is 277 miles, it's 18 miles wide, its height is a mile, it enters the canyon at 2,800 feet above sea level, it exits at 1,800, and the peak is 7,000. So what that means is if the river, millions of years ago, started carving the Grand Canyon, the river would have to go uphill before it got down here. That's a problem. Again, this doesn't make any sense uh, from a, a long, but if a whole lot of water came all at once and just pushed everything out all at once, and then the Grand Canyon formed afterward, I mean the Colorado River formed afterwards, well that would make a lot of sense. Okay, so this right here is a lake that used to be here, okay? Hopi Lake and Grand Lake. These are lakes that are dry now. They're not there anymore. The Grand Canyon is over here. This dam broke and the water rushed out and carved the Grand Canyon. In fact, if you go with creation tours, the Creation Ministry in Santee, they will take you out to the desert and show you all the leftover dirt from where the Grand Canyon, the dirt, came out and left it right here in Southern California. It's amazing. So this right here is on the top of... These are potholes on the top of the Grand Canyon. That's created by water rushing and drilling down into the ground. Well, why are they on top of the Grand Canyon? You have to have water on top of the Grand Canyon to get potholes on top of the Grand Canyon. Okay? So, what, is this, what does this mean? This is all evidence, and there's tons more too, right? I have notes to add more stuff on this. This is all evidence that the Grand Canyon actually formed... Uh, was formed by the flood. And so, if, it, if the flood really happened, God is serious about judging evil and sin, right? And that means, when he says, Jesus says, I'm coming back, and there's going to be judgment, well, we need to take that seriously. Because this is evidence of the truth of God's word. The, the history recorded in the Bible. Jesus is our ark, right? He's the boat this time. And he offers that free gift of salvation to anyone. He's willing to pay for our sins, but we have to be willing to get on board. And that's really the issue here. God offers the free gift of salvation to anyone who asks. That's the beauty of it. There's no cost to it. He already paid the cost. All he asks is that you hold out your hand to him and give your life over to him. Make him your boss, right? That's what I tell my students. Make Jesus your boss. Um, he becomes the guy you follow from here on out. So as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And so our lives really have to be about letting more and more people know about the truth of Jesus Christ. And being and this is one way that we can effectively communicate to people, hey, this is the real deal. The Bible's a real history book. When it reports about science, it's accurate. Okay, so um, before I close this in prayer, uh, uh, Pastor Alex asked me to ask if anybody had any questions, anything that uh, anybody is curious about. And... Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that I can.
Or did you want to write, have people write things down or anything? Or? Okay. Yes. Oh, the 2012 clip. <laughs> he really wants to see that. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, but I don't have it. I don't have it on here. And for some reason, it's not in there. Sorry. <laughs> Anything else? You can watch that at home with your parents. It's a little scary, though. Okay, well, that means I, get, I did a good job, so <laughs> awesome. Okay, thank you very much, you guys, for having me. I really appreciate it. I'll close with some prayer, and then... Lord, uh, thank you so much that your word is true. Uh, and thank you that we don't have to be afraid of the flood. We don't have to be afraid of the judgment, because you have given us the gift of eternal life through your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to have the courage to reach out to those around us and to love them to you, Lord. Help us to be lovers of people and lovers of you, God. We thank you so much for all the good things we have and all the blessings we have, Lord. Help us in our weaknesses and uh, strengthen us in our strengths, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you again for having me, you guys.